I got to get through. So I want to thank Chow for inviting me today. I'm here from the Lung Committee. That's fine. You can start on this slide. And uh, I actually started my career with the CDA through the VA um, at the West Los Angeles VA. Um, right now I'm at uh, Cedar sinai and I'm the chair of S2302, also called Pragmatica Lung, which if you've been at the meeting, you've probably heard a few times. And um, hopefully this is a trial that overcomes a lot of uh, the issues that we've just been discussing about how do we pay for things and how do we uh, make things more uh, just part of standard of care. So this is a trial that um, grew out of our S1800 uh, A that was run through the lung map trial and was presented at ASCO last year. And this was that was a remiserumab and pembrolizumab versus standard of care, but the standard of care was pre prescribed as single agent chemotherapy or docetaxel remiserumab. And that study showed an improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.69 and uh, about, about a three month improvement in overall survival, 14.5 versus 11.6 months in the standard of care arm. And that was a robust randomized phase two trial, but it was thought that there was there, there would need to be a phase three trial in order to bring this combination into the clinic. And this is for patients who have received prior chemotherapy and immunotherapy with recurrent or, um, or stage four non-small cell lung cancer. So this is an area where we'd have limited uh, treatment options. So based on that, um, we came together with CTEP and the FDA and tried to come up with what we call a pragmatic trial. And the, the key piece was that we again, we had a phase two trial. We saw overall survival improvement without a pro progression-free survival improvement. And we know from ramucirumab and pembrolizumab across many, many diseases that the toxicities, we know what the toxicities are and felt that we didn't need to characterize those in a meaningful way. And from the phase two study, we saw that uh, standard of care chemotherapy had more toxicity than the combination of ramucirumab and pembrolizumab, and the overlapping tox toxicities were really um, insignificant. Um, so we have this trial randomized to standard of care versus ramucirumab and pembrolizumab. And the standard of care is not pre prescribed. It is based on what the investigator would normally choose. And we guide them to the NCCN guidelines, but it is really based on what they would normally choose. Next slide. And so again, this is just the background, what we talked about because of the phase two trial, we wanted to have a uh, a pragmatic trial that decreased the burden of trial participation. So you can see, you'll see from our eligibility that um, it's promoting inclusion of participants and also decreasing the burden on sites. Next slide. And again, our pragmatic design to empower investigators to treat patients as they would in the real world. And sometimes you hear real world studies that are more retrospective in nature, showing what we have done. And this is a prospective real world study, letting physicians treat their patients as they normally would. We have put in a, a lot of uh, things in place to decrease barriers to enrollment and really to minimize the data, data collection burden. And this is a registrational trial, so very novel for oncology. Um, Many of these trials have been done in cardiology, um, diabetes, other tumor types, but really in oncology and for registration, um, these trials, uh, the trials get more complicated rather than less. So really we're asking one question, what is the over or is the overall survival improved with the experimental therapy? Next slide. So again, our study objectives, just two, comparing overall survival between the two arms, and then summarizing reports of serious and unexpected high grade, greater than grade three, treatment-related adverse events. And in looking at our S1800A trial, we believe this is going to be less than 10% of the AE reporting that you would do at a normal, uh, in a normal phase three trial. Next slide. And this is a busy slide. It's not for you to uh, know everything on the slide, but I think the purpose of it is that this is all of the eligibility. There are no more eligibility. The eligibility really get to the heart of 
prior treatment, they have to have prior immunotherapy, and they have to have at least stable disease on prior immunotherapy. So we're looking at acquired resistance and not the patients with primary resistance. So 84 days, they have to have been on immunotherapy and have at least stable disease. And in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, we're now treating in the perioperative setting, adjuvant, neoadjuvant, um, consolidation after chemo radiation. And we're allowing those patients, and if they um, progress within a year, that that immunotherapy would be included as their um, immunotherapy to move on to this trial. They can only have one prior immunotherapy. This is not for patients who have gotten multiple lines of immunotherapy, again, and not approved in non-small cell lung cancer, but um, they wouldn't allow those types of patients. We do allow patients with sensitizing mutations as long as they've been treated with the appropriate uh, uh, inhibitor, um, but they have to also have the, the immunotherapy and chemotherapy eligibility met, which many of the things like EGFR, ALK, maybe wouldn't have met the uh, the criteria for acquired resistance on immunotherapy and prior chemotherapy. And the other important thing is that we have a broad performance status of zero to two, which is uh, uncommon in non-small cell lung cancer immunotherapy trials. Next slide. There may be a pop-up here, so you could click twice probably. One more time. And again, the standard of care is based on what the investigator would normally choose. And we guide you to NCCN, but we do not have a pre-prescribed um, standard of care arm. And they should be administered as according to the FDA package inserts and according to institutional guidelines. So we do not, there are no um, deviations for uh, infusion times or things like that. There's no collection of those types of things. Pre-medications are based on your institutional guidelines. So a lot less um, places for potential deviations. Next slide. The remesirumab and pembrolizumab are uh, covered and uh, provided by uh, CTEP in this trial, and they're given on the standard 21-day cycle. And um, again, we do labs as we would per their package inserts, um, but nothing is specifically pre prescribed in the protocol, and we don't collect that information in case report forms. Next slide. So then here comes the study calendar. And again, it's all a busy slide, but this is the study calendar. There is no more. And I think that um, as far as an investigator and thinking about conduct of the trial, ultimately it will be easy because you do what you normally would do within your clinic and within your practice. Um, and again, it should minimize uh, cost to any site, the VA or any site. Um, I think what's been hard is in the startup process, we have amazing coordinators that work with us and they go to the protocol and they go to the study calendar and they say, where are the labs? Where are the scans? Where are the things that I'm normally um, looking for? And so we've been talking about this, especially at the SWOG meeting this year, and probably will come up with a worksheet that sites can put together to um, document what they think they'll do for their patients. It's really standard of care. I think for most patients, we would be getting labs every uh, cycle, every three weeks, every cycle, and uh, scans about every um, usually about every three cycles, at least every three months. Um, but again, limits what uh, would have extra cost to any system. Um, so really vital status assessment for, um, for, uh, for evaluating overall survival and the SAE assessment are the main pieces. Next slide. And I think click twice again. Um, and then, so we have very simplified data reporting and forms. We have a reduction in the, the number of time points, a reduction in the number of forms, and the number of data elements. We don't include tissue specimen collection. We don't include image submission or recist reads. Um, and there are no patient reported outcome instruments. Um, we do have a pathology form that we want completed and uploaded and uploading of their NGS forms um, for their um, demographic information at uh, the start of treatment, but um, nothing, no, no specific tissue collection. Next slide. 
I get, these are just kind of informational. This is, this is again, uh, all of the forms that we have for this study. There are no other case report forms. So at baseline, we have a number of forms to get the information and, and demographics and prior treatment. Um, on treatment, we have the vital status and adverse event forms. Um, off treatment within 30 days, again, vital status and treatment summary forms, late adverse events and the vital status forms that continue and that at the time of death, the notice of death form. Next slide. I think I show uh, some of these slides we can go through. These are just the simplified reporting. Again, alive, dead, um, date of assessment, and is the patient still receiving protocol treatment, and any reportable adverse events during this time. Next slide. Oh, you could keep clicking, sorry. Um, the adverse event form, and again, we're trying to this is very different than what people are used to filling out for NCTN or most studies. And so these are unexpected and treatment related. And so for if a patient has uh, grade three pneumonitis um, from the immunotherapy, that would not necessarily be um, unexpected. And uh, so it would not necessarily be reportable. So there are very, very few adverse events that are actually reportable. All grade five uh, would be reportable. Next slide. Um, and again, here's our study treatment forms. It, it goes through what the patient has actually been treatment with, whether they had a, an adverse event, um, and uh, whether they're still receiving study therapy. Next slide. And then the notice of death form, but highly simplified. Next slide. Um, and we upload a pathology report. We upload the PDL1 and NGS reports, um, but uh, not radiology and not uh, specific tissue. Next slide. Informed consent can be remote, um, and there's a whole process for that. Next slide. And uh, there is increased funding for this trial as it's a registrational trial, but the auditing process and, uh, and again, burden of data submission is a lot less than most trials. So hopefully the funding for this trial will be more in line with, uh, with what the, the work is asked to be, that's asked to be done. And there's, uh, we ask that you get, try to get squad, SWOG credit for entering patients into this trial. Next slide. We are trying to increase our recruitment efforts and try, trying to evaluate our ability to recruit from underrepresented groups. We have a firm that we're working with who will be um, producing a patient a, a educational awareness materials. All patient content will be um, translated into Spanish. We're engaging our patient uh, advocacy organizations and have additional materials for support and awareness. We will uh, start monthly site support calls, especially for those sites with underrepresented groups. And uh, we'll be having newsletters to recognize high accrual, diverse accrual, and best practices. Next slide. We'll be specifically um, evaluating um, enhanced outreach for sites with high participants with uh, underrepresented groups. We'll be monitoring the representativeness of the enrolled population throughout the trial and get uh, targeted uh, enrollment or, or, or targeted outreach and support for these. Next slide. And there are there is some work to get patient reimbursement. Um, we don't have this in place yet, but we're uh, we're looking at um, gift cards, which kind of decrease the burden on the site and decrease the burden on the patient for reporting. And um, this is something that is actively um, being evaluated, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to put this into place. It has not been uh, standard in SWOG studies that uh, that we have seen. Next slide. Um, again, resources on the CTSU uh, website, and they're working on patient-friendly uh, trial summary and uh, social media toolkit, um, and um, some help with EMR templates and EMR compliance for local institutions. Next slide. And I, I just want to thank everybody who's been involved. We have support from both Merck and Lilly for this. We have uh, all of our NCI and CTEP partners, um, NCTN, all of the NCTN groups have been uh, 
uh, very excited and partnering with us from Alliance with our co-chair, uh, Constantine Dragneb, and we have uh, champions from ECOG Akron and Energy Oncology. The FNIH has helped to move this forward as this grew out of our lung map process, and Friends of Cancer Research, um, again, have been highly supportive and helping to push this through. We have our uh, SDMC, who has been um, amazing and helping us to make sure we run this correctly. And Mary Redmond as our lead statistician and her whole team and our project ma manager, Mariah Norman. And uh, with that, I thank you for listening and thank you for your support of this. I think um, the VA sites will be, uh, this This should be a trial that uh, resonates with many, many patients. These are most of our patients that we see that are uh, end up being refractory to immunotherapy and chemotherapy and hopefully um, an ease of uh, conducting the trial at VA sites. All right, questions. I there, I know there's one question online that we have. Uh, if a site has us nineteen hundred e open, could they open this trial as well? Yes, and so this is a trial. So if they were, if a patient was on nineteen hundred e, which is our KRAS, uh, our lung map trial that um, puts KRAS patients on sotorasib, they could potentially get this after the sotorasib. And so it's not uh, overlapping in that way. And so at this moment in time, this is really, we don't have an unmatched substudy for the lung map protocol platform and uh, really are promoting this study right now for our unmatched patients because that is the cohort of patients that should go on to this trial. Um, it really should fit for many, many patients. I think this could help boost accrual at any site that's looking to uh, increase their accrual as many of our sites are trying to do. And again, reducing burden on our staff, which I think we're all struggling with in the post-COVID era. Any other questions in the room? Can I make a comment? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, Karen. Thank you very much for presenting. Was there one online? I'm sorry. I think it's Chow is talking. This is Chow from Kansas City. It's a thing. Yeah, I can barely hear you. I can, I'll repeat it if you can hear me. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'll repeat what he says. Yeah, so I just want to, uh, again, uh, thank Karen for presenting. I thought this was a, you know, the right study for the VA setting with reduction in paperwork and reduction of the labor that goes into the research coordinators to do the study. And I think the, the, the VA sites that do clinical trial think it's an ideal study to do it since you will provide the study drugs and the standard of care is, is what we use in the, in the real life, in the real world setting. Thank you. Thank you. So he, he was just stating um, that this is should be a, a good trial for the VA setting with the with the non-prescribed uh, standard of care that people can use what they use in their institution, and that we provide the invest both of the investigational drugs, um, and we have limited uh, data collection for this study. So thank you. Yeah, I I agree with that. Maybe not this study, but future studies that are kind of designed around this model might be really good for our node sites and some of the other things that we're doing with LPOP and, and other things where we might not always be using the academic affiliated medical center, but maybe our more remote centers, like in our case in Colorado, we have Grand Junction, who could very well do clinical trials. Um, and this would be a perfect fit for them. Uh, Cheyenne might be Another one where um, you know they give standard chemotherapy, and we just need to to uh, you know, as we all say, bring research to the patient instead of the patient to the research. So I think that's the goal, and I think SWAG is trying, and I think all the NCTN groups are trying to have a more balanced portfolio and pulling in these types of pragmatic trials where it makes sense. Yeah, 